Imagine while baking a pizza, you accidentally use chocolate sauce instead of tomato sauce. The end product won't be a pizza, but a new dish. Likewise, in your body, if a particular base in your DNA is inserted, deleted, or rearranged, it would result in a mutation, which can be defined as a change in the genetic code resulting in a loss or gain of a codon. Mutations can be triggered by a host of factors, including physical and environmental factors, such as exposure to the ultraviolet rays of the sun, radioactive radiations, or harmful chemicals. Mutations, which often result in undesirable effects, can be classified into various types, including point mutation and frame shift mutation. To understand these two types of mutations, let us use the statement, the cat ate the rat, to represent an DNA template. The individual words of the statement represent triplet DNA codons and the letters represent nucleotide bases. Moreover, just like an DNA template, the statement is a reading frame where the words are contiguous and non-overlapping. In point mutation, only one base is substituted by another base, which results in a change in the genetic code. In our statement, if we replace C with B, the altered statement will read, The bat ate the rat. Such a change in the genetic code can lead to undesirable consequences. For instance, a change in a single base pair in the gene for the beta-globin chain results in a change in amino acid residue glutamate to valine, which ultimately leads to sickle cell anemia. In the case of frame shift mutation, two or more bases are either inserted or deleted from the DNA template. For instance, in our example, if we insert two letters R and K, it will change the reading frame, and hence the altered statement will read, The cat arc tet her at. Whereas, if we delete the two letters, that is 1C and 1A, from the original statement, the altered statement will read, The tat eth era t. Likewise, in a frame shift mutation, if three or multiples of three bases are inserted, are deleted, it will result in the deletion or insertion of a codon. This in turn will result in the creation or deletion of an amino acid. Interestingly, frame shift insertion or deletion of one or more bases changes the reading frame only from the point of insertion or deletion. This point is clear when we compare the original statement with the statements that represent the mutation. Did you know that frame shift mutation is common among textile workers? This is because they are often exposed to acridine dyes such as 5-aminoacridine which enters their bodies through inhalation or physical contact. These dyes get intercalated or wedged between two adjacent purines and thus increase the distance between them from 3.4 angstroms to 6.8 angstroms leading to frame shift mutation. Chemical, physical and environmental factors thus lead to the addition or deletion or replacement of one or more base pairs of a codon which in turn causes frame shift mutations and point mutations. A series of experiments conducted by scientists and biochemical experts proved that both RNA and DNA served as genetic material. However, the question that arose was what exactly made both DNA and RNA suitable genetic materials? The answer lies in the fact that for a molecule to be a genetic material, it must fulfill four simple conditions. It should be structurally and chemically stable, which means it should not change with age, change in physiology or life cycle. Yet, despite stability, 
the molecule should provide scope for slow changes or mutation that is necessary for evolution. Further, the molecule should be able to express itself in Mendelian characters and also be able to generate its own replica to become a genetic material. Most biomolecules including proteins fail to fulfill these criteria. Even so, both the nucleic acids, DNA and RNA meet all these requirements. Although it is to be noted that DNA serves predominantly as genetic material, RNA also acts as genetic material in few microbes such as tobacco mosaic viruses and QB bacteriophages. And also performs the role of a messenger and adapter. Of the two nucleic acids, it was DNA that played a part in Frederick Griffith's experiment. Where R strain bacteria had been transformed to living S strain. However, though the transformation killed the mice, it had not changed the properties of the DNA. This can be explained by the stable structure of DNA that although being separated due to exposure to heat, it can come together under suitable conditions even after. RNA on the other hand is much more liable to change due to the presence of the very reactive 2OH group that is present in its every nucleotide. This makes RNA more degradable and reactive than DNA. Also, it enables RNA to act as a catalyst in several biochemical reactions in living systems. Moreover, DNA has thymine instead of uracil that is present in RNA which makes it more stable. For this reason, it is also said that DNA has evolved from RNA with chemical modifications, making it more stable and as a result, a better genetic material. Yet, both DNA and RNA can mutate. However, viruses with RNA genome evolve faster by mutation due to the ability of RNA to mutate quickly on account of its relative instability. Nonetheless, RNA can directly code for protein synthesis and thereby easily express the characters. In this regard, DNA is dependent on RNA Not only protein synthesis, but also several essential life processes such as translation and splicing are evolved around RNA. Therefore, even though DNA is the preferred genetic material due to its stability, it is the RNA that is involved in the transmission of genetic information. Proteins play a pivotal role in the proper functioning of any organism. The synthesis of proteins occurs in a cell in two phases, namely transcription and translation. The process of converting mRNA codon sequences into an amino acid polypeptide chain is called translation. Prior to translation, mRNA, which is synthesized in the nucleus of a eukaryote cell, migrates through the nuclear pore into the cytoplasm of the cell. The cytoplasm also contains tRNA, amino acids and ribosomes all of which are involved in the process of translation. The amino acids and tRNAs in cytoplasm 
become activated by a process called the charging or amino acylation. During this process, amino acid binds with ATP in the presence of amino acyl RNA synthetase and is activated into amino acyl AMP enzyme complex. This complex reacts with tRNA and transfers the amino acid to it. As a result, tRNA becomes activated as amino acyl tRNA and the enzyme and AMP are liberated. The tRNA has an anticodon loop which determines the amino acid that will link to it. This anticodon of tRNA is complementary to the codon sequence on the mRNA and will only bind to that codon. Apart from tRNA, a ribosome is another component required for translation. It is made up of structural RNAs and about 80 different proteins. In the inactive state, a ribosome consists of two subunits, a large subunit and a small subunit. The large subunit consists of two sites, the P or peptidyl site, also called the donor site, and A or amino acyl site, also called the acceptor site. At these sites, the two subsequent amino acyl tRNAs bind and facilitate the formation of a peptide bond between the two amino acids. The ribosome also acts as a catalyst in the formation of the peptide bond. Another component in translation is mRNA, which consists of the start codon AUG that codes for methionine, the stop codon, which is either UAA, UAG, or UGA, the region that codes for the polypeptides, and regions that are not translated into proteins called untranslated regions or UTR. These regions are present at both the 5' end before the start codon and the 3' end after the stop codon and ensure efficient translation. Translation occurs in three phases. Initiation, elongation and termination. In the initiation phase, the small subunit of the ribosome moves along the mRNA strand to locate and bind to the start codon AUG. The first amino acyl tRNA carrying the amino acid methionine with an anticodon UAC binds to the start codon at P site, after which the large ribosomal subunit binds to the small ribosomal subunit containing the mRNA. Another amino acyl tRNA now binds to the A site of the large ribosomal subunit. And the first peptide bond is formed between these amino acids. The peptide bond formation is catalyzed by the peptidyl transferase enzyme. The formation of this bond requires energy, which is obtained from ATP. Simultaneously, the first peptidyl tRNA gets removed, leaving the amino acid. The next phase is elongation in which the ribosome runs along the mRNA in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction, moving from codon to codon and adding subsequent amino acids to the growing polypeptide chain. This is caused by the elongation factor translocase, and this process is called translocation step. On reaching the stop codon, UAA, a release factor, or RF, binds to it, terminating the translation 
and releasing the polypeptide chain from the ribosome into cytoplasm. After the termination, the small and large subunits of the ribosome dissociate and the mRNA degenerates. The polypeptide chain is therefore an end product of the translation process that takes place in the cytoplasm. Regulation of gene expression refers to controlling the timing of appearance and amount of protein that is synthesized. Gene expression results in the formation of a polypeptide, which is why it can be regulated at several levels. For instance, the different colored patches on a calico cat are due to different levels of expression of pigmentation genes in various parts of the skin. In cats and other eukaryotes, genetic regulation occurs at the following levels. Transcription, post-transcriptional modification, transport of the mRNA from nucleus to cytoplasm, and translation. While in prokaryotes such as E. coli, the predominant site of gene regulation is the initiation of transcription. Therefore, we see that gene expression is regulated differently in eukaryotes and prokaryotes. Since gene expression results in the formation of a protein, genetic regulation controls which protein must be synthesized and which protein need not. For example, E. coli can use glucose, a monosaccharide, or lactose, a disaccharide, as its source of energy. However, lactose needs to be hydrolyzed or digested before it is used, and hence the bacterium prefers to use glucose when it can. But in the absence of glucose and presence of lactose, E. coli synthesizes an enzyme, beta-galactosidase, to catalyze the hydrolysis of lactose into galactose and glucose. However, in the absence of lactose, the bacteria will not synthesize the enzyme beta-galactosidase. This shows that gene expression depends on the metabolic, physiological or environmental conditions that exist in the cell. Moreover, Gene regulation allows the cell to control its structure and function. This is the basis of cellular differentiation, morphogenesis and adaptability of any organism. In fact, the development and differentiation of an embryo into an adult is also the result of coordinated regulation of expression in several sets of genes. In prokaryotes, the predominant site of gene regulation is the initiation of transcription. In the transcription unit, the interaction with accessory or regulatory proteins regulates the ability of RNA polymerase to recognize and bind to a promoter, that is, the start sites, when regulatory proteins act positively, They are called activators. And when they act negatively, they are called repressors. The accessibility of promoter regions on the DNA in many cases is regulated by the interaction of proteins with sequences called operators. The operator region lies adjacent to the promoter. In most cases, a repressor protein binds to the operator sequence due to which the operator is inactivated and hence transcription does not take place. But when the repressor protein is removed, it activates the operator 
and hence transcription occurs. The regulation of gene expression can be studied by the operon hypothesis. Let us now understand genetic regulation with the example of lactose or lac operon in E. coli. The lac operon was described in detail by two people, a geneticist, Francois Jacob, and a biochemist, Jacques Monod. They were also the first to explain a transcriptionally regulated system. The bacterium E. coli uses either glucose or lactose as a source of energy. Depending on the source of energy available, there are four possible situations that exist in the bacterium as shown in the table. Before we understand the lac operon in detail, let us understand what an operon is. An operon consists of a structural gene which codes for several proteins and is regulated by common promoter and regulatory genes. Each operon has its specific operator and specific repressor. For example, the lac operator is present only in the lac operon and it interacts specifically with the lac repressor. The lac operon consists of one regulatory gene or I gene and three structural genes lac Z, lac Y and lac A. The I gene codes for the repressor. The structural genes code for enzymes required for the metabolism of lactose. The lac Z gene codes for beta-galactosidase, which hydrolyzes lactose into galactose and glucose. The lac Y gene codes for permease, which increases the permeability of the cell to lactose, while the lac A gene codes for transacetylase, whose function is unknown. The switching on and off of the operon is controlled by lactose and is hence the inducer. Since lactose needs a small amount of permease enzyme to enter the cell, a very low level expression of the lac operon is continuously required. The lac operon functions in the following manner. The repressor protein is continuously synthesized from the I gene. The repressor in its active state binds to the operator sequence, thus preventing RNA polymerase from binding to the promoter site and transcribing the operon. In the presence of the inducer lactose or allolactose, the repressor is inactivated and transcription proceeds. Thus, regulation of the lac operon is an example of regulation of enzyme synthesis by its substrate, that is, synthesis of the enzyme beta-galactosidase by its substrate lactose. This regulation of the lac operon by the repressor is called negative regulation. In this way, the lac operon demonstrates how gene expression is regulated in an organism. In the past, biological researchers could study only one or two genes at a time. This changed completely in 2003 with the completion of the Human Genome Project. With the entire gene sequence and advanced genetic engineering technologies at one's disposal, biological research could now be conducted on a larger scale. For example, biological researchers could now study all the transcripts in an organ, tissue or tumor. It was also possible to study how thousands of genes and proteins work together inside our cells. 
HGP itself was made possible by two major methodologies of biological research, expressed sequence tags or ESTs, or DNA sequence tags and sequence annotation. In EST or DNA sequence tag method, the focus was on identifying and isolating all genes that expressed as RNA. Actually, EST is the term for all genes that express as RNA. With EST, numerous databases of nucleotide sequences have been made available. It has facilitated the construction of the preliminary transcript map of a human genome. In the second methodology, the entire set of genome that comprised all coding and non-coding sequences was indiscriminately sequenced and later different regions of the sequence were assigned with a function. The assigning of functions to sequences is called sequence annotation. For the purpose of sequencing, the complete DNA was extracted from a cell and divided into smaller fragments since it is technically difficult to sequence longer fragments of DNA. These DNA fragments were then cloned in suitable hosts such as bacteria or yeasts with the help of specialized plasmids or vectors. The vectors were called bacterial artificial chromosomes or BAC and yeast artificial chromosomes or YAC respectively. The cloning amplified each DNA sequence which made it easier to sequence. Sequencing was then done by automated sequencers that worked on a principle developed by Frederick Sanger who was also responsible for developing a method to sequence proteins and amino acids. As per Sanger's method, the cloned DNA sequences were arranged based on the overlapping regions present. For this, overlapping segments were generated. However, aligning this was not an easy task. As per Sanger's method, the cloned DNA sequences were arranged based on the overlapping regions present. For this, Overlapping segments were generated. However, aligning this was not an easy task. Therefore, specialized computer-based programs were developed that annotated these sequences and assigned to a chromosome. Out of the 22 autosomes and 2 allosomes X and Y, chromosome 1 was the last that has been sequenced in May 2006. Did you know that chromosome 1 has the most number of genes? That is 2968, whereas chromosome Y has the least number of genes, only 231. These challenging tasks would not have been possible if advanced genetic engineering methodologies had not been put forth by the HGP, consequently paving the way for useful biological research. In the past, it was believed that proteins were the genetic material. However, in time, through the various experiments using bacteria and viruses, the truth about genetic material came to light. British bacteriologist Frederick Griffith was the first to conduct experiments with bacteria Streptococcus pneumoniae that was responsible for causing the disease pneumonia. He worked with two types of bacteria strains, the pathogenic S strain and the non-pathogenic R strain. The S strain has a polysaccharide coat that makes it smooth. 
whereas the R strain lacks it, making it rough. During his experiments, Griffith realized that when heat-killed S-strain cells were mixed with R-strain living bacteria, and this mixture was injected into healthy mice, they died of pneumonia. Thereafter, when the bacteria were isolated from dead mice, they were found to be of the living S-strain type. This proved that the R-strain bacteria had transformed to the living S-strain. Yet for a long time, due to lack of conclusive proof, proteins were believed to have caused this transformation. However, in 1944, Oswald Avery, Colin McLeod and Macklin McCarty worked together to determine the biochemical that had caused the transformation in Griffith's experiment. They repeated Griffith's experiments and purified all three biochemicals such as proteins, DNA and RNA from heat-killed S-strain cells to identify which one had caused the transformation. They discovered that neither the protein digesting enzymes, that is, proteases, nor the RNA digesting enzymes, that is, RNases, affected this transformation. Whereas DNA digestive enzyme, DNAs, did inhibit the transformation. Therefore, it was clear that the transforming substance was not protein or RNA, it was DNA. Eight years later, in 1952, the definitive evidence that DNA was a genetic material was provided by Alfred Hershey and Martha Chase. They conducted their experiments with viruses that attack bacteria, better known as bacteriophages. Bacteriophages attach to bacteria and implant their viral genetic material inside the bacterial cell. The bacteria treat this genetic material as their own and produce more of such virus particles. Since Hershey and Chase wanted to find out whether it was protein or DNA from the virus that entered the bacteria, they grew these viruses on two different mediums one with radioactive phosphorus and the other with radioactive sulfur. As DNA contains phosphorus while protein doesn't, the viruses that were grown in the presence of radioactive phosphorus had radioactive DNA and not radioactive proteins. On a similar note, as DNA doesn't have sulfur like proteins, the viruses grown on radioactive sulfur had radioactive proteins and not radioactive DNA. Thereafter, both these radioactive phages were allowed to infect E. coli bacteria. Later, after the infection, when viral coats were removed from the bacteria, it was revealed that the bacteria that were infected with viruses containing radioactive proteins were not radioactive. On the other hand, the bacteria that were infected by viruses with radioactive DNA were radioactive. It was clear then that proteins did not enter the bacteria from the viruses. Rather, it was the DNA that passed on from the virus to the bacteria. Therefore, despite experiments by Griffith and Avery, McLeod and McCarty, it was the experiment by Hershey and Chase that proved the fact that genetic material is DNA. Did you know that except for identical twins, it is very unlikely for two individuals to have the same DNA pattern? It is the small difference in base pair sequences of DNA that make the phenotypic appearance of each individual unique. 
the human genome has about 3 billion base pairs. Therefore, it would be a time-consuming and expensive task to find out the genetic difference between two individuals as it would require comparing two sets of 3 billion base pairs. An easier and quicker solution to comparing DNA sequences is DNA fingerprinting, which is a test to classify and analyze DNA or the genetic information. In human beings, 99% of DNA base sequences are identical and are known as the bulk genomic DNA. The remaining 1% DNA base sequences differ and are present as a small stretch of repeated sequences known as repetitive DNA. DNA fingerprinting identifies the differences in this region. To separate both genomic as well as repetitive DNA, the process of density gradient centrifugation is carried out. As satellite DNA is lighter and bulk DNA is heavier, they get separated on the basis of their density. Graphical representation shows bulk genomic DNA as a major peak and repetitive DNA as smaller peaks known as satellite DNA. Satellite DNA is highly repetitive and consists of non-coding sequences. Based on the length of the segment, base composition and number of repetitive units, satellite DNA can be classified as mini-satellite DNA and micro-satellite DNA. Mini-satellite is a section of DNA which has a variable number of tandem repeats or VNTR. It has sequences of 15 to 100 base pairs repeated hundreds or thousands of times. On the other hand, microsatellite is a section of DNA which has tandem repeats of shorter sequences of 2 to 10 base pairs. Both mini satellite and microsatellite DNA act as molecular markers in the DNA fingerprinting technique. These satellite DNA do not show any impact on reproducing ability and exhibit a high degree of DNA polymorphism or genetic variations within a population. DNA polymorphism is the result of mutations in either somatic cells or germ cells which accumulates over generations. DNA polymorphism is the guiding principle behind genetic mapping and therefore helps in the DNA fingerprinting technique. The DNA fingerprinting technique was developed by Alec Jeffries. This technique involved southern blot hybridization which used radio-labeled VNTR as a probe. VNTR is a small sequence of DNA arranged tandemly in several copy numbers which varies from one chromosome to another in an individual. A very high degree of polymorphism is seen in the number of these repeats, due to which the size of the VNTR varies from 0.1 to 20 kilobytes. Let's now study the steps involved in the DNA fingerprinting technique. First, the DNA is isolated and then digested by restriction endonucleases which results in DNA fragmentation. Next, these DNA fragments are separated with the help of gel electrophoresis. and then transferred to synthetic membranes like nylon or nitrocellulose. This step is followed by the hybridization of the DNA fragments 
using a radio labeled VNTR probe. Finally, the hybridized DNA fragments are detected by a technique called autoradiography conducted using an X-ray film. Hybridization with the VNTR probe results in an autoradiogram which produces several bands of different sizes. These bands provide a characteristic pattern to an individual's DNA and vary from one individual to another except in identical or monozygotic twins. Today the accuracy of the DNA fingerprinting technique has further improved due to the advent of the polymerase chain reaction or PCR where multiple copies of a single DNA sequence can be made. DNA fingerprinting has also advanced due to the use of different types of DNA probes. DNA fingerprinting is used in many areas. It utilizes DNA as an identification tool and helps in forensic applications such as crime investigation. It also helps determine genetic and population diversity, forms the basis of paternity testing in case of parentage disputes, and also helps in the study of evolution and speciation. In this way, DNA fingerprinting has revolutionized the process of DNA testing as it can identify the minute differences between various DNA samples. The human cell is an amazing structure which is busy carrying out various life-sustaining processes, one of which is protein synthesis. For this process, it is essential that amino acids which lie scattered in the cytoplasm are carried to the messenger RNA or the mRNA template, the site of protein synthesis. Till the 1950s, scientists did not know enough about how proteins were carried to the mRNA. The breakthrough came in 1955, when Francis Crick, who had earlier revealed the DNA structure and its properties, postulated the adapter hypothesis theory in which he stated that it is therefore a natural hypothesis that the amino acid is carried to the template by an adapter molecule and that the adapter is the part which actually fits onto the RNA. In its simplest form, this hypothesis would require 20 adapters, one for each amino acid. Soon after Crick published his hypothesis, scientists across the world worked to find this mysterious adapter molecule that adapts itself to carrying amino acid and reading it to the codon of mRNA. Success, however, came to Robert Holly when in 1965 he discovered transfer RNA or tRNA, the adapter molecule, and also worked out its entire chemical structure. Today we know that tRNA the smallest of all RNA molecules is made up of about 75 nucleotides. Synthesized from a DNA molecule in a process similar to the synthesis of mRNA, tRNA is soluble in one molar NaCl and is hence known as soluble RNA or sRNA. Each tRNA has G at its 5' prime end and CCA at its 3' prime end. Interestingly, tRNA takes the shape of a clover leaf when examined as a two-dimensional structure, whereas it looks like an inverted L-shaped molecule in a three-dimensional structure. Regardless of its dimensions, a tRNA consists of four arms or sites, ribosome recognition site, anticodon site, enzyme recognition site, and amino acid binding site or carrier end.
Each of the tRNA regions perform a particular function. Take the case of the ribosome recognition site, which recognizes specific ribosomes attached to the mRNA and brings amino acids to the ribosome for protein synthesis. On the other hand, the anticodon site consists of three nitrogen bases called the anticodon. During protein synthesis, the anticodon pairs with the codon of the mRNA strand. However, the anticodon of tRNA is complementary to the codon of the mRNA strand. Apart from the anticodon site, a tRNA molecule also consists of an enzyme recognition site, also known as the D-arm or dihydrouracil loop. This particular site is the recognition site for amino acid synthetase enzyme, which helps the amino acid bind to the tRNA. Incidentally, this binding takes place at the 3' end of the amino acid binding site. Did you know that there is a specific tRNA for each of the 20 amino acids found in the human body? Also, there is a specific tRNA called initiator tRNA which initiates the process of protein synthesis. However, there are no tRNAs for stop codons. tRNA is thus an important molecule and it plays a vital role in protein synthesis by bringing amino acids to the mRNA template in the cytoplasm.